Brian, you uh, were on that hilltop. You had your observation team, those remaining, uh, withdrawing. <clears throat> You're being overrun by the North Vietnamese. What's going through your mind at that time? Well, <clears throat> didn't want to be overrun. The, the objective was to keep our unit integrity. Um, although we couldn't hold that fire base, uh, we gave up ground um, a bunker at a time. It's hard to describe what an American fire base in the mountains looked like, but it was essentially trench warfare because the, you had bunkers everywhere and the, the paths in between the bunkers were essentially trenches. Um, machine gun fire could graze the top of the bunkers. Theirs grazed it, ours grazed it. Um, you know, they, were, they, they, they had cover on one side, we had cover on the other, uh, but you couldn't go over the top. Uh, and it's fairly easy to plug the trenches. All it takes is one rifleman. Um, but it was pretty obvious from the get-go that we weren't going to hold that position for very long. Um, it's just a matter of how much we could slow them down. Um, we had one machine gun, uh, South Vietnamese gunner. The, uh, the fire base was a South Vietnamese artillery fire base, not an American one. And essentially, my observation team who were I guess I'd had them organized for six weeks. Um, we got that, uh, what they call an integrated observation system. It was uh, a laser ranging device. Well, we could range survey accurate out to about 20 kilometers in Vietnam. We had a night observation device that let us see at night just as far out, and we had a pair of uh, battle cruiser Navy binoculars. Um, we could see a long way and call artillery on whatever we could see, and supposedly it was first round accuracy. In theory, um, it was still dumb artillery, uh, <laughs> that you still had to do some adjustment. Um, the suitcases arrived in the battalion. I was given the manuals and the instruction read up. You'll get people the next day. I started to get good people from the battalion. Um, the, uh, the sergeants, mostly the sergeant major and the battery tops, kind of knew what we were getting ourselves into. It was going to be a hybrid squad out of the headquarters, somewhere between communications and forward observing and survey and who knows what. Um, so we needed to, we had to have, uh, I had to have a good sergeant, and I did. Um, and I had to have pretty good people out of each of the supporting batteries um, so that they would, uh, so that the personalities would click and there wouldn't be any internal dissension. Uh, once I got them, that was my leadership problem to get them to work together. The advantage was that uh, we were all new to the equipment. We all had to learn what the equipment could do, and of course we all had to learn each other's jobs. So for five or six weeks, even though I had several assignments to observe from different locations, we were always teaching each other what we knew. The, uh, Wes alluded to the individual replacement. Well, we all had different DROS times. So when somebody left, Everybody had to be able to do that person's job. And we didn't expect to get a replacement that could do exactly everything that the person left could do. So our problem was everybody had to be able to operate a radio. Everybody had to be able to call artillery fire. Everybody had to be able to do maintenance on a generator. Everybody had to be able to do survey. You know, everybody had to learn to do everybody else's job. And that, you know, that was my primary asset on taking five or six people that didn't know each other and um, tur turning them in what turned out to be a real good squad. Um, I mean, if they hadn't done their job at O Dark 30 when the first rounds came in, I would still, I would never have been allowed to wake up, let me put it that way. Um, the, uh, 
the operating instructions that we had were the two people that were always awake were always fully armed. Their job was to wake us up, go forward of our bunker, and give the other four people a chance to wake up, get dressed, and get out. And that we were able to do. It just cost me those first two men. And one other guy that was trying to take care of one of them that was wounded and then subsequently became a KIA. The one that, um, that was taken care, he became our medic. Uh, we didn't know that he was a medic when we got him. But after five or six weeks, he was our medic. All OJT. Um, he's still missing in action. Um, in the afternoon, um, when we realized that we were being pushed off one end of the fire base and they had over half of it already, um, clear day, the helicopter pilots were doing all they could to strafe and keep them off of us, but they just said, They're, they keep coming. Whatever they had, they kept coming up the hill. Um, and then it turned deathly quiet. And after you've been listening to a 50 caliber all day and small arms all day, um, when it stops, um, you know that it's time to go. And that was basically, we, 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 we said, if we don't leave now, we never will. And that's when um, one other lieutenant that was up there with me, a MACV uh, lieutenant, uh, he got to lead what was left of the party out. My job was to basically call blocking fire. Um, as Wes mentioned, it's terribly difficult to disengage um, with any unit that's in the attack. Um, your back makes a bigger target than your front. Um, and the only thing I had left was a platoon of uh, artillery to shoot blocking fire. The only location that they had was where the enemy was, which was my previous coordinates. I was maybe 30 meters away from them. Um, it was a direct fire mission for them. They could see the fire base. Uh, I, asked for, uh, I asked for blocking fire on that position and got it uh, eventually. Um, As they were getting ready to say they were ready to shoot, I started running. Uh, an alarm clock goes off in the back of your head that says it's time to zig and zag and stop presenting such a wonderful target, um, either to the enemy that might have foolishly crossed over and tried to continue the assault. I say foolishly because they were monitoring our radio signals. We were monitoring theirs. There were no secrets up there that day. Um, from either side. Um, and if they didn't get me, the artillery would, because it was going to be variable time, an air burst. Um, and you didn't want to be on that fire base when that artillery started coming in, or even anywhere close to it. So uh, I got off the trail to catch up with the others and started zigging and zagging, and it wasn't too long before I realized I wasn't going to catch up with them best thing I could do was find some cover, hunker down for the night, and see what the morning brought. And uh, my guess was that eventually, because there were four artillery tubes on that fire base, um, the South Vietnamese weren't just going to leave them there for the North Vietnamese to use against them. And that was a correct guess. Um, South Vietnamese uh, 442 Ranger Battalion combat assaulted in the next day. Just took me a week to get back across to friendly lines. <clears throat> I was never that, I was never more than 500 meters away, I would guess, from the fire base, just out of small arms range, um, in a bamboo thicket, but surrounded. And like I say, the rest is history.